This is your reminder that the BBC has yet to address the consistent transphobic leanings in its news coverage. And while the team behind Doctor Who is not connected to this in any way, since this is a BBC-owned property, I'm going to keep pointing it out until the problem gets resolved. Links in a pinned comment below if you don't know what I'm talking about. I'll stop saying it when it stops being a problem. You know, when you're a geek-focused channel and you upload normally on Saturdays, and Saturday happens to be May the 4th, as in, may the fourth be with you, you are obligated to do something Star Wars related. So anyway, I'm going to talk about Doctor Who. You know, I, I considered putting my note about the BBC after the intro, uh, so it wouldn't give the joke away, except then it occurred to me that the joke is already given away by the thumbnail and title. But whatever! New Doctor Who! It's coming. It's coming up fast. I am allowing myself to get excited about it. This after having had a period where I was feeling a lot less enthusiasm, but it's built back up again between excitement to see what Shudigatwa does in the part, some of the more recent things that RTD has said. Uh, I did a video earlier in the week talking about that stuff, so if you're wondering what I'm referring to there, you can check that out, because part of the reason I made that whole other video was so that it would not eat up time in this one. What I want to do is allow myself to be hopeful, talk about what I'm hoping for in the new season of Doctor Who. Now, what this is not going to be are any kind of ideas, notions, or hopes, or wishes for specific plot turns, because I don't do that. Like, I, I just don't. It's not even like a matter of principle. My brain doesn't work that way. Trying to be like, ooh, they should do this with the story. I Even if I try and do that, my brain basically goes, why are we wasting thinking power on this? Just wait and see what actually happens, and then have an opinion on that. So it's very, very, very rare for me to get speculative or to give a wish list of specific uh, narrative things that I want them to do. So don't expect too much in the vein of that. I mean, I guess a little bit, sort of, but I want to talk more broad for the most part. And I'm also going to try and limit this to things that I think are actually possible. Like, if I had made this before uh, Church on Ruby Road aired, I might have said, I hope that there are no mystery boxes as the overarch overarching uh, season story element. I am not going to do that because it's been made pretty clear that that's something RTD is bringing back. Never seen a TARDIS before. I wish he wouldn't. He already said he is. So there's no point in me putting out a hope like that into the world. Uh, and I'm not going to be bitter about that, or at least I'm going to try not to be. I want this to be positive. I don't, this I don't want this to be a stealth way of being like, well, this stuff sucks, so don't do it. Like, I can't promise none of that will creep in because I'm a cynical person. But I'm a cynical person in a good mood today. So maybe we can be more or less positive. Also, I think this is the first time I'm... Showing this off? I, I had uh, a time earlier where I, I debated whether or not um, I would feel comfortable doing uh, cosplay as uh, Shudi Gautwa's doctor. Uh, that was something I had to kind of ruminate on a bit. It, it felt weirder to not do it. I've been doing it with a lot of doctors. I don't have an outfit for every single doctor, but I've had a look that I've done for the ninth doctor, the 10th, the 11th, the 12th, 13th, even the 14th, I adjusted a little bit to try and match what the specific episodes were a bit more. It would actually stand out more for me to not do it for Shudi Gatwa. So here we are. Anyways, what am I hoping for? Well, this one seems pretty likely. New villains, new aliens. Look, I have a lot of issues with the Chris Chibnall era of Doctor Who when he ran it while Jodie Whittaker was playing the Doctor. However, I think one of the more intelligent things he did, at least on a philosophical level, 
was to have its first season not just be a wash in callbacks and older material. That first series that he did, Series 11, is not perfect. A lot of problems, actually. But one of the things I did appreciate appreciate about it was it didn't heavily lean on nostalgia. It didn't bring back the Daleks. It didn't bring back the Cybermen. It didn't bring back the Master. Most of the stuff would come back <laughs> almost immediately after that with the dogs coming back in the holiday special, which, like, I'll say again, I actually liked that. I, I like the pattern of the dogs being in the holiday special. That actually feels really appropriate to me. But anyways, like, brought them back, and then the following series bringing back the Master and then the Cybermen. And it's like, oh, okay, well, everybody's here again. But honestly, I still think it is an intelligent move for that first season to have been all new stuff, and to try and really put a stamp on it. This is what we want it to be when we're not giving you what you already know. And so, while I'm not going to go so bold as to say there should be no returning aliens or no returning villains, if there are none, I support it. But at the very least, as few as the show feels like it can get away with would be my own personal ideal. Now, I know there's plenty of people uh, on in Doctor Who fandom who are already speculating about who's coming back and people are dropping Sutek for some reason. And, and the Ronnie, because always the Ronnie. It's never the Ronnie. But I think especially, especially this season where there is a big push to bring both a new audience in and a return returning audience, I think it's important to not lean too heavily on the nostalgia. That may seem weird. You might find yourself thinking, well, what about the returning audience? That's what the specials were for. That's what bringing Tenet back as the 14th Doctor was for. That was to show the audiences who maybe dropped off, maybe during Chibnall's era, maybe during Moffat's era, who was the showrunner between Russell T. Davies running the uh, revival originally and then Chibnall taking over. In between, there was Stephen Moffat. And for fans who fell off, that was their chance to be like, okay, come check this out. This is how we are approaching revisiting older characters, older faces. See if this works for you. And for some it did, for some it didn't. But that was that was the bone thrown to the fans who might have dropped off, to the people who wanted a taste of what was old. Now... Let's not lean overly heavily on the history. You could have some, but let's not make it the main focus. Let's certainly not do it in a majority of the episodes. Definitely, like, cut it back as much as you can manage. This is your chance to sell Doctor Who to a whole new audience. Don't bog it down in fan service. Don't bog it down in old references and I'm specifically highlighting the villains and the aliens because I know some older stuff is already coming back. We have Mel back, who is a classic era companion already returned in the special The Giggle. And depending on how that's managed, I might be okay with that. But the villains, oftentimes bringing back an older villain is a reason not to explain them very well. I mean, one of the things that was especially powerful in that first series of RTD running the show was the episode Dalek, which was a full proper reintroduction of the Daleks as a concept. But pretty much every time they've come back since then, including under Chibnall's era, it was just like, oh yeah, these things, you remember these things. It's like, well, what if they don't? And I'm not sure you're going to do well to try and recreate what Dalek the episode did. But it's pretty rare for Doctor Who to bring back old creatures and like give it a full proper reintroduction. It tends to just be like, here they are again. Maybe let people decide they actually like the show, um, if, especially if they're new here before getting too much into that. You know what else I'd like to see? I want to see some big swings. This is one that I'm, I'm, I'm semi-confident about. Here's what I'm confident about. Here's what makes me nervous about. It. When I say big swings, I mean... Bold ideas, bold takes. Give me more of things like the wild blue yonder. Give me more of things like midnight, of things like heaven sent, of things like blink, of things that may not be completely typical of what Doctor Who has been or even will be in the future, but you wouldn't find somewhere else. And understand, this in and of itself is a gamble. Not all big swings are good episodes. Love and Monsters was a big swing. Hellbent 
was a big swing. The Timeless Child was a big swing. They don't always work, but I usually at least appreciate going for it. And the reason I'm, I'm ever so slightly nervous about this is because of the episode count. Seasons keep getting shorter. And while this is not super unheard of for UK series to be fairly short, as this is looking to be, Doctor Who has been getting shorter for a while now. When it first came back, it was 13 episodes to a season. And it stayed that for a while, and it was 12, and it was 10. I mean, Flux is kind of an outlier, but like it's we've been getting less. And that does make it riskier to take big swings because now even if you only do one big swing, it is a higher percentage of what you've put out into the world and you're not putting out as much reliable stuff. So in general, I feel like seasons are getting too short. There's a lot of complaints to be made about the old format of especially American television where 20 to 24 episodes was kind of uh, the typical thing. Like, there were certainly shows that couldn't support that, and you'd get filler, and you get stuff like that, but all, also, you'd get a lot more weird experiments with the format. Like, we've got 24 episodes to fill this season. Who's got a wild idea? Because we need, we need something. You would get that more with that stuff, and less with shorter and shorter seasons. But, seeing as RTD himself already gave us a pretty big swing, in my opinion, with Wild Blue Yonder... Yeah, I feel like it's it's a pretty safe bet there's going to be something like that here. Another thing I'm pretty hopeful will be the case, a focus on bonding between the Doctor and the Companion that will not revolve around anybody's romantic pining. It is, of course, not impossible that this might still end up happening, but so far, when RTD has talked about the connection between Shudigatwa's Doctor and uh, Ruby Sunday, played by Millie Gibson, the emphasis has been on their similarities, and in particular, he's brought up the fact that both of them are functionally orphans. They don't know exactly where they came from, and that is a way for them to connect, a way for them to bond, and it's a way to do it that is absent romantic tension, because I don't like romantic subplots in general. I especially tend to not like them when they involve the Doctor. Now, Granted, this is something that RTD both introduced into the franchise, uh, but also himself seemed to realize, oh, maybe I've done what I can do with that. Romance for the Doctor as a character wasn't really a thing, especially not with the companions. Heck, when the 90s TV movie that had Paul McGann as the 8th Doctor had him kiss the companion, the fans were in an uproar over that. And it was not that much better when it happened when... Christopher Eccleston's Ninth Doctor kissed Billy Piper when the Metacrisis Doctor kissed and then went off with Billy Piper with Martha in Series 3, romantically pining for the Doctor who was emotionally unavailable because of the loss of Rose. Thankfully, by the time we got Donna Noble in, uh, RTD moved off this. No, no, we're not married. We're so not married. Never. Never, ever. Unfortunately, it cycled back in a little bit with Amy, which... <laughs> I did not like, I like Amy a lot, did not love that, but the nature of romantic bonding, just overall, like, whatever was going to be gotten out of that, I feel like we got it. I feel like we got it mostly with Rose, and then we got, like, the unrequited with Martha. I think we got whatever was worth getting out of that, and I'm hoping and hopeful that the focus will be on different ways for them to connect, because I, I also find it Heavily cliche that, you know, oh, here's our lead guy. Here's our lead gal. Sure, there's romantic tension. Why? Why? Peter Capaldi never really had that. I mean, the only real romantic leanings he had at all were with River Song, who was an established character, uh, effectively romantic, with multiple incarnations of the Doctor. And yes, I have avoided the topic of Yaz and the 13th Doctor, but that's because it didn't amount to much. Almost nothing was done with that. Like most of Chibnall's era. Ah! <laughs> positive. Positive, positive, positive. So my positive spin is to build a really strong, caring, loving even, platonic connection between the Doctor and the Companion. And I think there's a good chance that's what we'll get. There's really been no indication of heading in another direction. Uh, i.e. towards the romantic. So I'm pretty confident about that, but I still, I, f I feel like 
I feel like I need to put that out into the universe. Here's another one I'm pretty sure they're going to do, although I am slightly nervous about this one. Embrace whimsy. And I understand whimsy is not the same as, like, kitty and lighthearted, necessarily. Like, I would actually call some episodes of Chibnall's era pretty whimsical in a lot of ways, but they're also some of the more weird and, at times, dark things. Like, it takes you away is kind of whimsical. It's also bizarre and dark. Similarly with Can You Hear Me, which, for the record, those are two of my favorite episodes during Chibnall's run. Um, but, you know, beyond that, the Peter Capaldi episode the Last Christmas, lots of whimsy in that. Also really dark. Scary. But just bringing that touch of anything could happen here. And we are getting that feel already with what we've already had and what we've seen in the trailers. I am a little bit worried about the extreme that's going to be brought to. It brings to mind, again, the um, uh, the butterfly effect joke that I saw in the trailer, which I really didn't like. There is a way to overstep this, um, just in terms of being uh, tone-breaking, basically. But overall, I do like me some whimsy. And I like when the Doctor Who is whimsical. Doctor Who, even classic Doctor Who, is delightful when it's whimsical. You can go back to stuff like... The second Doctor and the Mind Robber. That's a very whimsical episode. It's fascinating. Fourth Doctor had plenty. Most of them did somewhere along the line. And that's just an energy I enjoy from Doctor Who that uh, I'm excited to see more of. And finally, I hope that the show is not afraid to embrace darkness, but don't succumb to it. Here's what I mean by that. Doctor Who in its modern incarnation since being revived in 2005, has never really been afraid to get dark. People will die. Things will go badly. Characters will be traumatized. They won't get what they want. They won't achieve their goals. But at the end, there's always this sense of, okay, that wasn't good, but we're all right. Or we will be all right, if not right now. To make the contrast, a uh, stretch of episodes of one of the spinoffs of Doctor Who, Torchwood, that RTD himself, Russell T. Davies, wrote was Torchwood Children of Earth, which I think is the darkest thing that Doctor Who has put on television. I'm not going to say it's the, dar the darkest Doctor Who thing ever, because there's some novels and some audio dramas that get... Whew, there are a lot, um, but I think in terms of what's put and put on television, I think it is the darkest. And part of why it's so dark is not just because of the horrific things that get depicted in it, but also because at the end, you don't feel like it's okay. You don't feel like it's going to be okay. What happened is never going to be okay. And that was okay, to be clear, because it happened in Torchwood. Yes, it's set in the world of Doctor Who, but the Doctor himself should be a stabilizing presence. The fact that the Doctor is here should mean that on some level, it's going to be okay. That even when things get bad, it's okay. The Doctor's here. And that doesn't mean that the Doctor's perfect or goes unchallenged or isn't shaken by, what, by what's happened. But just that sense of, all right, that was rough. We pick up the pieces, we move forward. I feel like modern era Doctor Who, by and large, has done that very, very well. I think it's probably one of the reasons why I don't love Waters of Mars as much as everybody else. There's actually a number of reasons why I don't love Waters of, Mar Waters of Mars as much as everybody else. But part of it is that while I appreciate the potential, the dramatic potential of something like Time Lord Victorious, of the Doctor getting darker. <sighs> I get it, but I don't want it. It's also part of why I have no interest in the Valyard ever coming back. If you know your classic Doctor Who, this was a supposed evil incarnation of the Doctor. Um, by this point, the Valyard, like, the Valyard is a, a, a time anomaly. Like, he, he was a potential thing to have happened. He didn't. 
can we move past it? I don't think the value is actually that interesting. I don't think he was that interesting in his appearance. I don't think bringing him back would be that interesting either. But also, just, I guess, fundamentally, I want to know that the Doctor will be okay. Sometime, if not now, down the line. It's part of why I kind of loathe the thing that I see crop up now and then where people are very insistent that David Tennant's 14th Doctor, the one who retired, was going to somehow become the Valyard. Uh, no. No. Never. Because he got his happy ending. Let him have it. And stealing that from him to me, is actually a massive tonal portrayal of this show. Doctor Who can always get dark. It has always gotten pretty dark at times. The fourth, fifth, sixth Doctor era of the classic Who got notoriously dark at times, often in very good stories. But the Doctor and the Companion generally are okay. And even the times when they weren't, there was still a sense of, we have to move forward. There wasn't the wallowing in darkness. About the closest it came was the sixth Doctor's era, and it's part of why that era is a mess. But don't be afraid of dark. Doctor Who going dark has given us brilliance at times. I would argue that Heaven Sent, despite an absolutely triumphant ending, is very dark at times, and I adore that episode. Midnight incredibly dark and really, really great. Or even just dark and tragic moments, like in Doomsday, Journey's End. But there's still a sense of, but we keep going forward. And that sense of, it's not all waste. It's not all loss. It's not all pain. Torchwood worked for that. Torchwood was a show that did not benefit from whimsy. It actually hurt it more often than not. That was a show that could go that direction and make it work, and it leaned into the strengths of it. I don't think that's Doctor Who's strength. Not on the show. But I do know RTD can go dark. And I know he usually maintains that light at the end of the tunnel. Not that 100% everything will work out, but that on balance, it'll be okay. That's what I'm hoping for. Take me on the roller coaster. Make me afraid. Make me worried that it won't be. But, you know, I'm here ultimately to escape. And I'm not saying escapist media has to always have a happy ending, but Doctor Who, for me, has for a very long time been an escape to a fictional universe where somebody's there to make it all better. And I'm ready for more of that. So there we go. My hopes for the new season of Doctor Who. I am excited. I don't, I don't know on what days my reviews will be out. Because in terms of the timing for when these things release, I know I normally have videos out on Saturdays and that will continue to happen. The thing is, like, I try not to work on the weekends if I can help it. Um... And even when I can, sometimes I can't work on every weekend. So I will need to make a call on whether on weekends that it is possible for me to get uh, a review out sooner, if I will do that. And then weekends when I can't because I'm traveling or I'm or I'm busy with with other stuff. You know, keep in mind, I'm a parent. I have partners like I, I have a life um, that whether I'll just have. On some weekends, those reviews come out a little bit later, or if I will lock in a consistent um, release for reviews, which would, oh, it'd be Sundays at best, Mondays most likely. I don't know. If you've made it this far on the video, let me know. Do you want me to just get my reviews for new episodes of Doctor Who out as quickly as I can, and that just is whenever it is? Or would you rather have it be a set day that you know you can count it on? If you've gotten this far in the video, then yeah, I actually, I would really love your opinion on that. So drop that down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Plus your thoughts on anything else that I've talked about. That would all be lovely. If you want to support what I do, Patreon is the way to do that. Any amount is helpful. You get a look at most Saturday videos uh, at least a week in advance when I'm uh, on schedule, which I have mostly been sometimes 
stuff comes along last minute and throws things out of whack. But for the most part, I've been on top of this lately. So I'm feeling better about, <laughs> about pointing out that. But also you see the docket at the start of every month for what I'm planning to do that month. Sometimes you'll get to vote on topics such as what classic Doctor Who story I will do next. Things of that nature. Um, plus there's a Patreon exclusive Discord. Maybe check that out. I did more of a pitch than I usually do. Don't worry too much about it. What I really want you to remember is that you are beautiful, you are valid, and you are loved. You are the council. I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. Now to thank my highest supporting patrons, Robin Moore, Zubin Lutfola, Goddess Elida, Oliver B, Tarak, the thing that goes doink in the anime, Fare For It, Ulrich Bogdan, Loki Eris, Mer Melinda Walters, <laughs> Jen on DK808, Becky Sparks, Pranabilax the Poodle, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casper, Dave Hall, White Bearish, Rosalind Bennett, Toku Bluhuvian, Pau Barabajago, and marriage. Thank you for your support and for keeping me and these guys fed. What are you doing? 